Thanks very much. That was a just really nice. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I have very large shoes to fill after Professor Choker's uh, very incisive and, uh, and thorough examination of uh, some of the political, social, cultural uh, circumstances uh, that surrounded the, uh, the creation and the visiting uh, of the two pavilions. I'm trying to, I'm going to do something very different, and what I'm going to do is actually new to me too, because uh, being a political scientist, I don't really look at uh, world exhibitions, world fairs, uh, I'm not a social historian, um, but I do work quite a bit uh, about Israeli politics, and I read quite a bit of Israeli news um, in both uh, Hebrew and in English, and that's what I decided to do to actually take this opportunity and see how the event, this specific focus uh, on the Israeli pavilion, but more broadly speaking, Expo 67, was translated, interpreted, portrayed to the readerships of, uh, to two Israeli readerships, those who read the Jerusalem Post at this time, the premier, the largest, uh, the singular English language uh, newspaper uh, at the time, and the Marif, which, had, uh, which was the largest uh, uh, Hebrew language uh, uh, paper uh, in, terms of its, uh, in terms of its circulation uh, at the time. And then I, so there is a bit of uh, false advertising in the title, I will pay lip service to, uh, to some of the Jewish press uh, uh, that, uh, that I had access to, but uh, much of the analysis is really looking at uh, how the event was portrayed, what were the main stories, what were the main mentions, and really one of the central questions that I'm interested in is how Marib and the Jerusalem Post in particular took the and seized the opportunity that Expo 67 provided to contribute to creating a stronger, greater understanding of and knowledge of Canada, Montreal, Quebec uh, in the eyes and in the minds uh, of the two respective um, Israeli, Israeli leaderships. So um, I do want to say uh, thank you to Concordia University's library, represented by uh, Mr. Jeffrey Little, today who made it possible for our institute and our researchers and students to actually uh, have digital access or access to the digital editions of uh, the Palestine Post as well as Jerusalem Post. And, uh, and my uh, source in terms of the Hebrew language newspaper, uh, Marib, is coming from the uh, digitalized uh, uh, service provided by the National Library of Israel. Uh, they have a fantastic uh, historical Jewish press um, uh, collection which, uh, which you can now have access to. So, um, as I said, this is, uh, this is what I try to do. So the first question, and uh, my students in the audience know that I like numbers, charts, and figures, so I have to start the presentation uh, with that as well. So the first chart uh, that I'm looking at is really taking a look at uh, the coverage uh, of Canada, Quebec, and mention really of Canada, Quebec, and Montreal in the Jerusalem Post during the decade. During the decade starting in 1960, going to 1970. And my central uh, point of interest, a question of interest here is whether 1967 stands out as a pivotal turning point. In other words, do we see more mention of Canada, Quebec, or Montreal after 1967. Does 1967 stand out? So, ladies and gentlemen, please take a look at the red bars, sort of the, 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 the tallest bars uh, in this chart. You'll see that there is a very steady building up of more and more mentions of Canada in the Jerusalem Post. So the red bars stand for the mention of Canada in the Jerusalem Post. And the numbers are fairly nice. I mean, we start with over 400 mentions. Uh, and of course, that's, uh, that's on the yearly basis, so it's still not a lot. Uh, but in 1967, just over 400 mentions of Canada in all kinds of different contexts, sports, politics, culture, uh, trading, and so forth. 1967, if you uh, take a look at the chart, really reaches a high point. And what's very important to note that the mention of Canada, so Canadian portrayal in the pages of the Jerusalem Post, after 1967, never drops below what it had been previously. And if you continue the trend line after 1970, it's a very, very steady shooting upwards. So clearly 1967 was important. It, uh, it stands out, it was the peak uh, compared to, to, to previous years, but it's also important to note and keep in mind that uh, based on the mentions, uh, how many times Canada is mentioned in the, in the paper, uh, there was already an upward trend. So 1967 really didn't make that trend, but it was important. And you can see something similar when it comes to the mention of Quebec and Montreal. 
but uh, you know there was never the, the, the average mentions of uh, of uh, Montreal and Quebec never dropped below uh, what they were in 1967. But what's absolutely striking is the gap between how frequently Canada is mentioned and how frequently either Montreal or, or Quebec are mentioned. And if you look at the difference between even Montreal and Quebec, you'll see that the average reader of the Jerusalem Post really didn't get to read much and get to know much about Quebec. Canada figured most prominently, followed by Montreal and then followed by Quebec. Now that's really not that different from what you see in the Ma'arif. So now we are looking at the Hebrew readership. Um, the numbers are different, the overall numbers. We clearly see that the highest mention is still given to, uh, to Canada uh, and followed by Montreal and Quebec. And 1967 here, however, doesn't stand out. There were previous years, uh, and in particular 1964 uh, is an important point to note. 1964, 65, those are the times when the first conversations start taking place about potential future participation. Uh, but really 1967 doesn't stand out as clearly uh, in this, uh, in this uh, bar chart analysis uh, as we did uh, see on the pages of, uh, of the Jerusalem Post. Now, the next two charts are looking at the year 1967 from January till, um, uh, till, uh, till December. And it's important to see the lead up of the stories and the frequency of the mentions both leading up to April, May and then thereafter. Uh, clearly, there is a, a, a very slow but still pronounced increase in how frequently uh, uh, Expo and Expo and Israel, Expo 67, are mentioned uh, from the start of the year. April uh, marks a high point, and then of course May. And I'm going to tell you why and what were the specific, the specific stories uh, that, uh, that the Jerusalem Post reported on in the month of May. Then, as Professor Chopper reminded us, comes the war in early June. And Expo 67 pretty much drops off the pages of the Jerusalem Post. Just look at what happens after May. June, July, August. We get, we start seeing more action, a bit more coverage about Expo as we are getting close to the end uh, of the exhibit itself. And then something happens in December. In December, there's a small update. Now, who wants to read, right? Months after Expo is shut down, What's so special, what's so interesting about Expo 67 in December 1967? Ladies and gentlemen, a story that you never read about, you could never read about during the days of Expo. And that's the story of aerial relations between Canada and Israel. Israel tried to use and take advantage of Expo to lobby the Canadian government to grant special lending rights uh, for El Al so that greater and more frequent aerial traffic would be conducted between the two countries. And in spite of all the warm, all the positive, all the nice coverage that Canada gets throughout Expo, this diplomatic effort pretty much fails. And in December, uh, then you start seeing uh, references to in the Israeli press to say, well, uh, we couldn't take advantage of this opportunity, and unfortunately, uh, we do have to uh, keep our operations centered on the United States because we don't get the special lending rights that we are coveting uh, in Canada. Which raises the point, how did the participants, uh, at the Israeli participants at Expo 67 were able to come? How were the hostesses uh, able to land in Montreal? Well, uh, there were ad hoc special one-time uh, uh, permissions given. Uh, but uh, that, so it's a very interesting untold story uh, about uh, Expo 67 and the diplomatic relations between, uh, between Canada uh, and Israel. So that's why we see a uh, small uptick uh, in the in December coverage. Um, now, when you look at the Maharif coverage of Expo 67 and Israel at Expo 67, uh, please note that, of course, the numbers, and you can see the actual numbers uh, indicated along the uh, horizontal, sorry, the vertical axis, are far fewer, right? If you look at the numbers on Jerusalem Post, I mean, uh, the axis ranges from 0 to up to 40 uh, on the pages of the Maharif, far fewer mentions of uh, Israel and, Expo and, uh, Ex and Israel at Expo 67. So clearly there is far less exposure given to the Israeli, the Hebrew Israeli reader uh, about this important event than uh, what the English reader, the English language Israeli reader was able to get. And then uh, and then the distribution uh, over time is also quite a bit different, uh, which, is, uh, which is an important pattern that we can attribute to some of the stories that I am now about to give you both a general summary of 
and also invite you to read together with me because I will bring some, uh, some nice uh, selections and clippings from the uh, pages of the Marina and Jerusalem. So what were the main things that the Jerusalem Post covers? So, so far we looked at the numbers and the frequencies. Okay, but what God actually covered? What got the reader of the, the Israeli-English language reader of the Jerusalem Post excited? First of all, Canada-Israel relations. Now, the, on May 10th issue of the Jerusalem Post ran the single largest up to that point, and I think ever, special section of the newspaper devoted to any country in the world. The Jerusalem Post ran a 32-page special insert devoted not to Expo, to Canada. Canada. And the central message of this historic special section was to introduce and enhance an understanding in the minds of the Israeli leader about what several of the articles call the affinity of spirit between Canada and Israel the similarities of the development of the two new nations. Of course, relatively speaking, Canada is older, but comes about also as a new state, as a new nation, forging a national identity together out of different uh, uh, ethnic national groups that find home uh, and safety uh, in, the, in, in Canada. And that's a theme that many of the commentators, many of the contributors to that 32-page 32 32 special section <laughs> highlight. And of course, that special section also gave a fantastic opportunity for Canadian leaders, the Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition, the Trade Minister, um, the ambassador of Israel to Canada, but also the ambassador of Canada to Israel, to stress and, uh, and highlight some of these important points and some of these examples we are going to see. So stressing the deep bond that connects Israel and Canada together was a very important, and in fact that was the focal theme of that particular issue, and that really accounts for most of the mentions, uh, if you just check the number. The next most uh, frequently and uh, highly covered event was, of course, the uh, historic visit of the President of Israel, Zaman Shazar, uh, the Professor Trooper, Mr. Zimonif Kuman, uh, already alluded to, uh, to Canada. Uh, he, this was, of course, part of a broader, broader trip. He also visited uh, Scotland, Iceland on the same trip, but, uh, and, but Montreal and, uh, and Canada was a very important special visit. Uh, and it wasn't a special and important visit only for him. But, uh, but his wife, Mrs. Shazar, also was a very active first lady, if you will. She was meeting with num a large number of, uh, of Jewish, but not just Jewish, uh, Canadian women's organizations. Uh, and so she really played a very active role in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, helping Israel's diplomatic effort to connect with Canada and Canadian society in many, many different ways. A third uh, very important and highly covered theme was the story of the pavilion and, not, and the story that the pavilion was trying to tell and Professor Chopper already told you that better than anybody else would. The classic Zionist narrative, uh, the people coming back recreating sovereign state uh, for themselves. A very important segment, a very important part uh, of this story was of course a Dead Sea Scroll that was also brought to the Israeli pavilion. The commentary to the book of Habakkuk uh, was thrown from Israel, insured for 150,000 Israeli liras, and specifically flown, taking up two seats on the Al flight. Uh, the third seat in the row was taken up uh, uh, by, uh, by one of the uh, members, in fact, the leader of the uh, Israel Museum's laboratory team that made sure that the quality of the scroll is not going to be damaged during the long flight. The fourth important event that was mentioned is Habitat 67, which, ladies and gentlemen, has nothing to do with the Israeli pavilion. But it was, of course, a very important uh, output uh, delivered by an Israeli who studied at McGill University. When it comes to Expo 67, he is part of Israel. He is part of the Israeli narrative. Uh, and that's important to Numbers and statistics, Professor Chopper mentioned uh, already the important numbers. That's something that gets regularly covered both in the Hebrew and in, uh, uh, in Ma'ariv, as well as the English language Jerusalem Post. And so you really got regular update about when the Israeli pavilion got the first million visitors, the second, uh, and I think the highest, uh, the last, uh, the highest number reported was five million. Uh, but I'm going to let our uh, hostesses, our special guest, to correct me on that uh, uh, later on uh, in the afternoon. Uh, a very interesting story that got covered several times is the Shalom cruiser, a uh, cruiser, uh, cruiser belonging to the Zin Line, which made several special sailings, uh, bringing uh, uh, 
passengers who were able to uh, afford the hefty fare to, uh, to Montreal Expo. And of course, at this point, there are also great concerns about the future of the, uh, of the cruise line and of the shipping company. Uh, whether they, it would be sold and under what terms to, to a German firm. And that, uh, that also was part of the overall story told about Circo 67. The last two uh, stories that got many, many mentions, uh, or more mentions uh, uh, than not. First is the uptick in the exporting of Israeli beer. Gold Star, uh, at, towards the end of Expo, uh, gets secured a ship, uh, secures a shipment of about a quarter million bottles, and I'll show you a picture, uh, to North America. Uh, to New York as well as to, to Canada, but uh, Expo 67 is clearly credited uh, for, uh, for the exposure that Israeli beer uh, uh, was gaining on the continent. And public input. Uh, lots of letters to the editor are published which tell us very interesting uh, perspectives about how what people actually thought and felt about the pavilion. Uh, how many minutes do I have, Dr. George? Five minutes left, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, of course, uh, the story of the hostesses we'll talk more about today. This is the cover of the May's, uh, May 10th special issue. This is just a tease your uh, type. Uh, and that special issue told us a lot about Canadian foreign policy. The, uh, and this is just one quote. The important point uh, that, um, that the special issue highlights about Canada's foreign policy and diplomatic relations with Israel is that you are our friend. Uh, can Israel and Canada have a deep bondage, a, a deep bond that unites them together, but that doesn't mean that Canada is going to agree on every crucial political question with Israel. And the question about the Arab uh, refugees, for example, is mentioned in this quote, uh, and, um, and there are some other uh, questions about Israel retaliation policy that, uh, that Canada marks out as uh, maybe uh, areas of concern. But overall, the message that uh, the leader gets is that Canada and Israel are strong friends. Freedom of the press, again, very important story that the special issue tells us. Uh, the Israeli press is free and is held to the same high standards of journalistic uh, professional standards as, um, as you, what you would expect uh, uh, in Canada. I'm going to fast forward, but I did want to show you this, uh, this uh, quote, which, um, which also comes from the Jerusalem Post and which reminds the reader of the very deep cultural connection between French Canada and Israel. And that was a very important previously and often untold aspect of, uh, of this uh, of the journalistic coverage. I'm going to uh, skip sort of the ads. Uh, there were many, many ads, of course. Uh, it's cute to read uh, what some of the critical eyes uh, of the public uh, shared with the newspaper, uh, 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 with the newspaper leadership. And so this particular, um, I'm not sure if uh, Mr. or Mrs. Uh, Rosenblum uh, complains about the, the fact that there is very little to buy at the Israeli pavilion. And you can actually buy more Israeli products elsewhere than here. And the restaurant that we heard about is, uh, is not yet open. Uh, so this is a very crit critical, touching uh, um, letter to the editor. But look at the punchline. After all of this, no restaurant, you can buy enough. But Zionists can never be disappointed with wonderful Israel. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, I have so much more to tell you, but I think that's a good punchline to end up. And I'm going to stop here. Uh, I will save some of the other clippings that I brought from Hebrew and English, and so uh, I will leave maybe uh, uh, some of those to the Q&A um, and, uh, and handle that that way to make sure that we are not running over time. Thank you very much.